My name is Tilly Geidel. I'm with Bonded by Trauma. Um, my dad was a fireman lost on 9-11, Gary Geidel. And um, that's why I'm here to share uh, about my own trauma. So I am originally from Staten Island. Um, my dad's from Staten Island and my mom was from Brooklyn. Um, so my whole family's from the city. Um, we lived in Staten Island and my dad worked in Manhattan. Um, my dad was about to retire. Um, I was two months away from seven years old when 9-11 happened. You know, um, he was a, he had um, 20 years on the fire department and he was retiring in two weeks and we were in the process of selling our house in um, Staten Island and we were going to come move upstate and um, start a whole new life in like the country and um, then 9-11 had happened and the whole everything changed. Again, like I said, my dad was about to retire. We were about to move upstate. Um, that summer, we were back and forth a lot looking at houses, and we actually picked out the house we were about to move to, and it was just about we had to sell our house on Staten Island. Um, a few nights before, a um, few nights before 9-11, my dad was working. I was at school. Uh, he, our last day together was really nice. He, um, he got home from work, and I got from home from school. Um, my f mom, him and I all had dinner together. Everything was great. It was pretty funny because my parents, after we finished dinner, they had like this Irish music playing and they, were, they pu pushed all the furniture to the sides of the rooms and they were like dancing through the rooms together. And it was really nice. And um, um, my dad actually took overtime. He wasn't supposed to work uh, the day of 9-11. He had off. And... He was trying to take a bunch of overtime because um, he was about to retire, just trying to, you know, um, build up his pension for more comfortable living. And um, so he got a phone call from the firehouse the day before and the night before, and they um, told him that he had overtime. And my mom's kind of upset about that because she didn't want him working so much anymore. And he told her, you know, I have a few more tours to work and then it's done. Then I retire. So he's like, he knows what's best for this family. So he took the overtime and, um, you know, it's, it's crazy that he wasn't even supposed to work that day. So, um, lastly, the night before my dad was reading to me, he would read to me every night. And, um, I was like a real mommy daddy. I was always like really, really daddy's girl. But um, I actually slept between my parents still at that point because I was an only child. And um, so my dad was reading to me that night, um, the book he was reading to me at the time. And I fell asleep next to him. And so the next morning I woke up and it was kind of weird because I was never awake um, when my dad would leave for work. I would usually wake up after he already left and then I would go to school. Um, that morning, I actually was awake when he um, was leaving to go to work. He was running late that morning. Uh, my mom asked him if he could go to the corner store and get us some milk. So he ran to the store and got some milk and came back. So I actually was able to see him that morning. And, um, you know, uh, we were, I was on my stoop with my mom. And my dad hugged and kissed my mom and I goodbye. And he walked over to our gate to leave and then I remember him um, looking at my mom and I again and he came back to us and hugged and kissed us again which was very weird and then I remember him just getting in his van and him driving away and my mom and I were waving to him bye and um, so he was he was late and um, finding out later on um, he did miss the truck uh his firehouse left without him so what happened was my mom walked me to school my school is up the block and she walked me to school and dropped me off and she went home and um so i was in my classroom not very long into the day and at home my mom um 
received a phone call from my grandmother and she was pretty upset. And my mom wasn't aware of what was going on. Obviously, it was a different time. So, you know, not really, we didn't have computers or anything like that in our house. Um, you know, news spread, but not that fast like today. So um, my grandmother called my mom. She was all upset. And she's like, turn on the news. Look what happened. So my mom turned on the news and saw that a plane hit the World Trade Center. At that point, it was only one tower. So her and my mom were on the phone. And uh, live, my mom watched the second tower get hit. And my mom was like, oh my god, that's not an accident. Originally, everyone thought it was an accident. She's like, that's not an accident. This is a terrorist attack. So she hangs up with my grandmother and she calls the firehouse um, immediately when the second tower hit. She calls the firehouse. Actually, before that, she called the firehouse before she got the phone call from my grandmother. Actually, she called the firehouse and asked if my dad was in because they usually would talk and say good morning, whatever, talk for a little while before he started his day. And they said, oh, well, Gary didn't get in yet. Then she talked to my grandmother and saw the towers hit and everything. Then after she spoke to my grandmother, she called the firehouse back and there was no answer. So whoever she spoke to on the phone, when she asked if my dad was in yet, right before the towers hit, that must have been the last person he spoke to on the phone. Not sure which fireman it was. Um, so then my aunt was NYPD, my mom's sister. So she called her cell phone and got her on the phone and asked her if she saw my dad. Um, my aunt worked in... Um, in Manhattan, she was, um, it was actually weird because I, I figured it out on the map. She worked 11 minutes away from my dad's firehouse. They were 11 minutes apart. And um, they would meet up at calls a lot because usually the fire department and the police department meet up. So she didn't hear from my dad yet. She didn't see him yet. And um, she was, you know, looking for my dad. At one point, um, you know, my, my mom was on the phone with my aunt. She heard, like, screaming and people running up to her and stuff. And she hung up with her. My mom ran up to the school to come get me. Because at that point, uh, two towers were hit. Stuff was happening all over the country. They thought that the schools were under attack next. Especially since we were in the city. And um, so my mom ran up to the school. So I was sitting in my classroom. I had no clue what was going on. Every single kid was, like, getting called down. Um, in all the chairs around me, and uh, I was just like clueless what was going on. It was very weird. So my name was called next. So I'm walking down the stairwell, and my parents were talking about a camping trip prior to this. So I thought we might be going on a camping trip or something like that. Um, so I was up on like the second or third floor. So I was going down the stairwell, and when I got to the bottom, on the the at the bottom of the stairwell is a door. And there was a glass window um, they could see through. And I saw all through the hallway, it was just like mothers all over the place. And I walked out there and the office was actually flooded out the office down the hallway. And I'm like looking around for my mom. Then she saw me and she grabbed me and she was just like frantic. She was pulling me out of school. I wasn't aware of what was going on yet. And um, so... My neighbor actually drove my mom down to the school because my dad had the van. And um, so we drive back to my neighbor's house. She lived across the street and I went to her living room. And that's when I saw the replay of the World Trade Center getting hit. So I think at that point, it was already um, at the point where the towers came down. Uh, my mom was actually on the phone with my aunt when um, my aunt witnessed the towers coming down, which is also, I want to add, which was very strange. Um, my aunt um, just got a rookie on, and my aunt was actually supposed to be in the car with um, the one guy on patrol, and the rookie just started, and he really wanted to go on the ride, and my aunt's like, okay, you can go along in her place, whatever, and they wind up both getting killed, and she was supposed to be in the building, too. So, that was that was pretty crazy. So, um, at that point, 
you know, the news spread everywhere. There's this stuff is still going on. No one has heard from my dad. His company is they left without him. I, they had um, we had all my neighbors came to my house. All kinds of family was coming down. Um, you know, my door was just wide open. There was just all kinds of people flooding in our house. We were all praying, um, asking God to just like, please bring my dad home. We don't know what's going on. Um, once it got later, there was still no news. So, you know, the country was just on, on lockdown. The city was on lockdown. Um, my other aunt was a nurse at the time. She got stuck. I think it was in Jersey and my other aunt was, um, she was still in Manhattan. Um, so everyone was just praying and hoping that my dad was coming home. My mom was just like hysterical. Um, so it got later in the day and no one has heard from him still. And um, so this is when everyone came out with like candles and they were like praying and hugging us and everyone had little American flags. And we were across the street and just everyone was gathering together. You know, there was no sleeping at that point. And um, I was just, you know, crying that I want my dad. Um, so my grandmother took me upstairs into my parents' bedroom and she was trying to just like lay down with me to try to keep me calm, to try to get me to sleep. Obviously, I wasn't going to be able to sleep. And um, I just remember my mom was holding my dad's t-shirt that he wore the day before and she was just hugging his t-shirt and she was just like pacing and pacing. And then I heard a car pull up and I was thinking maybe it was my dad and my mom runs out and I went over by the window and I was watching and it was a police car and it was my aunt and then my I remember seeing my aunt my mom and they were like locked in a hug because they knew how that day would have ended for her also but she didn't get a hold of my dad um she was all over the city and she was trying to spread the word quickly and the sh she was um telling them have you seen Gary Geidel and um you know they were like oh you're the people started spreading the word like really fast and they're like oh, you're the police officer with the brother that's a fireman don't worry we're finding him we're gonna find him and the word spread really quick people started getting lists together really fast because there were so many people missing and unfortunately he was on the list um but then it started getting worse once you know the next day came and we still didn't hear from him and the next day came and um you know my um my grandfather he lived on the next block from me he went down to manhattan and he started doing the um doing cert doing the search with everyone um my uncle and my other uncle so both my uncles and my grandfather went down to manhattan and they were searching for my dad and um it's just crazy so immediately uh i think back and i think that like i always try to explain to people because they always hear like oh you were six years old you must not remember what happened and it's so far from the truth you know um i always say that's why i always make it a point to say i was just about to turn seven um when i think back of my mindset then it was so much more advanced and mature than you would think of a of a six-year-old now um I immediately knew once I saw the towers being hit, I immediately knew what was going on. And it was a totally different time. I was completely, I had no choice, but I was completely exposed to everything that was going on. The news was on in my house constantly. It was never turned off because it was always live updates of what was going on. I knew that my dad was trapped. I knew exactly what happened. Um, you know, I knew it was a terrorist attack. Uh, so we constantly had the news on. I was constantly seeing the updates of what was happening. I was exposed to the whole thing. Um, we would run up to the corner store every morning and grab all the newspapers and just try to get as much information as we possibly could. Because again, this was a different time. The internet wasn't really a big thing at all. Most people didn't have like the internet in their house. So it was all about the news and the newspaper and trying to figure out what was going on. And then, you know, my family just updating us of what was going 
on um, down at ground zero and uh, immediately I did know that it was a terrorist attack and we weren't really sure what was going to happen with our country but a lot of people started coming out and really taking care of us um, the firehouse in our town in Tottenville they immediately just like came down to our house and the whole crew just started feeding us I mean he we were one of the last families my my dad was never recovered or found anything like that so we were one of the very last families to have some sort of memorial service so we had this fire company at our house like every single day for almost an entire year it was it was crazy they really took care of us and people like some people really really stepped up um you know leading weeks and i'm looking back at it now and it just obviously it was unrealistic me thinking that my dad would have made it there were certain um we did find out i think it was the next day that there were some survivors and they started announcing some survivors so we um my mom was ecstatic we were all so happy we were hugging and crying and um you know my mom just kept saying if anyone could survive it was him he was an eagle scout he was a marine he was a rescue guy if anyone could possibly do that that it was him so we'd pray you know maybe that there's like a little broken pipe under where he is and he was able to get access to some kind of water or whatever was going on and i think um like my mom says it was kind of like our protective bubble where we believe that he was hanging on when realistically he couldn't have been but um we believe for a long time that he was coming home and you know my mom wanted to have the memorial service for him because you know he deserved it but at the same time if we did that it's kind of just admitting that it's true and the day that my mom really came to terms with it i think that it's true is that um when they announced the stop of the recovery the search and re uh, recovery and um it was august 2002 the end of august is when we held his memorial service so it was almost an entire year later so we decided to hold his memorial service um august of 02 and then we decided to move upstate to the house that he picked out in october of 02. i have really really bad anxiety and i have pretty bad ptsd as well as my mom um i have come to terms that it's more severe than i've ever wanted to admit uh, especially being exposed to such trauma at such a young age it kind of messes up like the way of your growth of your brain and um i was just thrown into very very raw very gory things uh, with the loss of my dad and then there's no answers and it's just it it is something that affects you for the rest of your life it's something that i do struggle with for the, the rest of my life um you know just i have a problem with going down to the city um especially manhattan i get um anxiety panic attacks it's really bad um in 2021 so the 20th anniversary i told myself you know i'm gonna push myself and i'm going to do this and i went down to my dad's firehouse the first time since about 03 and then i went down and i saw my dad's name at the memorial for the first time ever that's the first time i've ever even been to ground zero anything i don't think that i'll ever go into the museum because i it's, it's too disturbing for me but i do i do struggle with ptsd and anxiety from this whole thing and it affects me um on a day-to-day -day basis i try to um you know my faith and everything gives me comfort and i try to cling to that uh, around the summertime it gets pretty bad with um 
you know, I get um, really bad panic attacks. Um, I get nightmares. I have uh, just a lot of that kind of stuff. It is a struggle. You know, I think of my mine and my father's relationship was still like a little girl and daddy relationship. So we never got to have anything else after that. So I always think of like, that's my daddy. You know, I'm still in that mentality of like, when I think of my dad, I think of the daddy's girl, little girl, father kind of relationship. And there's always been that emptiness and the absence of my dad really affects me. Um, you know, so many things that I went through in life and my dad just wasn't there. And it's a struggle. Um, it really is. So one of the triggers that I get is always like um, emergency sirens. Every single time I hear like a siren of a fire truck or like a beep of a fire truck or even like a cop car or something like that, but usually I could tell the difference. But any time that I hear that immediately in my head, I picture all different kinds of emergency vehicles pulling up to the trade center and firemen running in and just like things like that. And, um, you know, just a lot of things like that is what triggers me really. I'm, I've learned because I've been dealing with it for, you know, 21 plus years. I've learned to like ride it out. Sometimes it gets so bad where, especially summertime closer to the date, because then it's the anniversary of losing my dad. It's the anniversary of his memorial service. Um, at that time, um, sometimes it's so bad that I actually have to lay in bed for the day because I can't get the panic attacks to stop. And my heart's pounding in my chest and I feel like I'm going to die. And, you know, it's hard to explain to people that it still affects you so greatly 20 plus years later. My mom is a very, very strong woman. She had to, she was thrown into my, you know, we had the kind of household where my dad went to work and he took care of that kind of stuff. And my mom took care of me in the house. And overnight, my mom had to step up and become the mother and father with my dad missing. And my mom really really suffers with ptsd it's like it's it's really bad um you know there was a time where when 9 11 just had happened she had um we weren't even sleeping upstairs we had a pull out couch on stand um on downstairs on our house on Staten island and she had um she actually had my dad's boots and then her pants inside the boots that way if um there was a phone call in the middle of the night that they found my dad and or she had to identify him or something she was always like um ready to just jump out jump up and run out the door and um we we're in a state of an emergency for a very long time you know that fight or flight kind of thing um it's kind of hard to get out of that and um you know my mom still has um problems with because the phone call with my grandmother again where she got the phone call and then found out about 9-11 and the terrorist attack and everything that was going on from the phone call so you know phone calls trigger her where you know if someone calls and they sound upset she needs you to tell she needs you to tell her immediately like it's okay no one passed away everything's okay like it's always that mindset of what's happening is did something happen to someone and I, I always think that way also where like, you know, someone's late or they didn't get home and I know it's not a normal way of thinking, but because of losing my dad, I, I always have that in the back of my head. Like, did this person pass away? Are they okay? What's going on? You know, 